Namaskar and good evening to all. So, uh, today is the last day of the lecture series of history of Western philosophy. Today we have with us Dr. Patit Pavandas and Dr. Kailash Chandra Maharana in the second session. So, both are the eminent family members. So, uh, formally I have to introduce uh, them uh, introduce both the speaker. So first, I'll start from uh, the past session. Uh, uh, will be the speaker is Dr. Patit Pavandas. It's indeed my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Patit Pavandas, Assistant Professor and Head Department of Philosophy, Ravensai University, Qatar. He's going to deliver his lecture on a complete overview of Western. European philosophy. Uh, Dr. Das has brilliant academic record throughout his career. Uh, his philosophical journey began from Government College Raulkela under Sambalpur University. He passed their Bachelor of Arts with first class uh, gold medalist in the year 2003. And then he moved to Utkal University, Bani Bihar Bhubaneswar, to pursue his master degree, and there also, again, he got first class first gold medalist, and after that, he moved to JNU New Delhi to pursue his MPhil there, and uh, passed in first uh, first class from there also, uh, and after uh, uh, he has passed. Uh, UGC net several times, two times in philosophy and one time uh, one time in Buddha, Jaina, Gandhi and Peace Studies. In 2007, he was also teaching assistant and JNU. Then he joined in a college under government of Tripura in 2008 to 10. In 2010, he joined Prevenza University. So, uh, he has published a number of book, five books, 26 articles. He has completed two research projects and guided also one PhD, one PhD student, five MPhil students, and many master's and undergraduate students. So, uh, there is a, a long profile of Dr. Das. And uh, I have introduced him very shortly. He has he he is academically active through many organizations. He has delivered many lectures and also uh, has coordinated book chapter. He has contributed. So he is academically very active and a leading scholar in Odisha. So the interesting thing about Dr. Das is that. He will never feel bored for even a single minute during his lecture. His lecture are very engaging in a very simple way. He tries to reach its students. With that, I ask all the participants to give your full attention to Dr. Das and welcome him on behalf. I welcome him, him on behalf of philosophy family. So welcome, sir. So Dr. Das, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Devasis. Uh, thank you for this wonderful introduction extended towards me. Uh, in fact, um, I, I must uh, feel privileged to be the uh, part of this wonderful family, uh, philosophy family. I must uh, be thankful for all the people who are doing this, uh, this wonderful job. Uh, and as directed by uh, Dr. Pramod Kumar Das, uh, I'm going to deliver on something which is very, very difficult, I think. Uh, but then uh, I, I had a try. <laughs> and the, the topic I, I wanted to uh, discuss today is the, uh, the evolution of Western philosophy. Is it uh, visible? Is the slide visible, Devasis? Or anyone, please? Uh, is yes, the slide sir. visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay, so uh, let me let me start with this. And as director, um, I mean, I, I should not have any audacity to speak in detail about all those masters, whom um, many you know stalwarts of philosophy from Odisha and other parts of the country you know, uh, have deliberated on. 
but i'll i'll simply engage on what type of questions actually were engaged in western philosophy that was my concern today and therefore i have written my topic as the evolution of western philosophy what how and why so this i think uh, uh, will be apt for this uh, uh, session today so let's uh, start with this the first question is how does it all begin today we are talking about western philosophy but then the very very interesting question is was it no did it start with a bank did it uh, start with a you know a lot of extravaganza or did it happen with a very humble manner how does actually it happen how does philosophy begin so that is the first question we should start with that is how does it all begin and of course as i said it begins with a bank but it's not like that the bang is it is when man asked a very simple and humble question that is what is this in fact you might be thinking that how surprising is this philosophy started with this question this is a very silly question isn't it this is a very normal question everyone asks this question every day every time right what is this what is that when we uh, find out any anything uh, we are st strolling on the road and we find something we ask this question what is this right and how is it that philosophy of which we you know esteem a lot started with this question what is this let's let's have a look okay i am sitting on this chair this is a wooden chair on which i am sitting that is there also in your uh in your presentation slide right and look this is this is a chair most of us don't ask what is this but anyone who has not seen the chair right before he must ask this question what is this and of course he wants to get an answer right and this is very silly we you can say okay this is a chair and someone someone might be more intelligent and he would say that this is wooden chair right and then over do you think that over no some people will go again ask another question what is that that is this what is wood look i said what is this you said this is a wooden chair and then i asked you again another question what is wood right and then someone will get an answer someone will give an answer i might be satisfied i'll stop but someone else will ask this what is a wood and then it will it will proceed on then people would say okay wood is uh, you know a part of a tree and then the question goes on from tree again up a jungle up mountain up world then goes to universe then goes to up and up never stops this question this simple silly question what is this never stops and when it becomes an unending journey that is the actually beginning of philosophy and this is how it started with like next what next what this what question actually goes up and up and up and then we find this oh, sorry yeah what is next we talk about nature then when the nature is complete then we go to world then when the world is complete then we go to universe and then go up right so we never stop and this is what this is the exact question what actually engaged the greek philosophers let let us start with this greek philosophers initial greek philosophers were actually engaged with this question they asked the same question what is this whatever they found around them right they simply asked this very humble and simple question what is this right and they never stopped there they asked another question they asked where does it come from even though it it is a ta table or it is a chair or it is anything else then they ne ask next question what is that they ask where does it come from who has done it who has made it 
So that is what is, where does it come from? And then they again ask this same question. You can find out this is quite logical, this is quite natural. You cannot stop simply asking what is this and stop there. Get an answer and stop there. We don't do that. Normally even in our practical life we don't do that. We ask the next question. Right? If someone says, what is this? Then we ask, where does it come from? Who made it? Right? And then if someone gives an answer to that, and we ask another question, where does it go? Right? Is it real or mere a copy? And you can, you can know, uh, associate this question with some, some philosophers in Greek, Greek civilization. Right? Plato was asking this question. Is this world a reality? or a copy? Is it one or many? Is it a form of form or matter? These are the sum of the questions. The root, root question is, what is this? But the peripheral questions are these, right? When you try to answer one question, that is, what is this? Automatically, these bundles of questions are thrown upon to you. And you are helpless unless you give the answer, right? And Greek philosophers exactly did this. And this is how philosophy started a beginning. Now, and this is how Greek philosophy was popularly known as natural philosophy. Why this is natural philosophy? Because Greek philosophers were more concerned about to understand what is this around us? What is the nature around us? Initially, they were not thinking what is beyond this nature. They were more concerned about the things which are found around them. So therefore, this is called natural philosophy. Most of the Greek philosophers were engaged with finding answers for the questions relating to natural elements, natural things. And that actually you know, gave rise to development of science. So most of the Greek philosophy, most part of the Greek philosophy was dominated by science, right? And of course, you might be knowing that Greek philosophy, Greek civilization was democratic in nature because they were giving, you know, value on pluralism because the nature is full of plurality. The nature is full of different types of elements and therefore, their philosophy could be characterized as pluralism. So this is how Greek universe started. And all of these, all of these questions give rise to what? Metaphysics. So Greek philosophers, they started a very humble beginning. They started asking questions, what is this? And they asked these questions to the things around them, but they never stopped there. They went and went up and up and up they entered to a speculative world. And that is how a very influential branch of philosophy took birth. That is called metaphysics, right? So up to the last, last duration of Greek, uh, Greek civilization, Greek civilization was entering more and more to metaphysics or speculative philosophy. Now, and they were engaged all these things. They were engaged studying of being or existence, of course, here and hereafter. That means they were studying what is there. Many people, they say that metaphysics studies beyond physics. Metaphysics, beyond physics, it is not. Metaphysics simply doesn't study beyond physics, right? Metaphysics has another name also. Metaphysics has another name is that it studies about physics. Right? And therefore, Greek philosophers were studying this world as well as the world beyond it. So they were studying the experiencing world, the real world around us, and they were speculating at the same time if there is another world beyond it. They were studying both. They were studying of life here and hereafter. Simply they were not concentrating on this life or even they were not concentrating on the life after it. They were not simply speculating about the after, after life. They were studying this life as importantly as the afterlife. They were also studying of the state. You might be knowing that Aristotle studied state so minutely and he studied state 
32 constitutions very minutely right so therefore the greek civilization studied the state real and ideal similarly they were also engaged in studying human behavior actual as well as desirable and you can you can understand now that how philosophy was keeping two legs in two places in the real world around us at the same time they were always trying to go beyond this real world and here comes another bank and the bank comes with another form of question i'll i'll tell you what is this right so philosophy traversed a lot with a simple question that is what is this but then another bank comes another very important you no know, thing happened and it is due to many factors one is the peloponnesian war this war was fought severely fiercely by two very important city states one was sparta and another was athens you might be knowing that athens was exactly you no know, the center of excellence the center of all kinds of study right athens and sparta was militarily excellent and these two people two city states fought a very fierce war that is called peloponnesian war and it lasted for a long time and of which athens actually was defeated by this sparta so with he, its defeat the academic excellence the civilizational excellence the cultural excellence went away deroded deroded to a lot okay and greek civilization gradually was fall prey to the rome but then all of sudden again rome was also fallen rome was destroyed this uh, the civilization of rome the empire rome empire of rome was also fallen and that that exa uh, exactly happened with the ascent of alexander the great now when alexander the great came to power in macedonia what happened actually alexander could wo win many of the countries right and greek civilization became open to the oriental civilization so two civilizations come closer with this you no know, alexander's victory right and what happened then the greek speculation comes contact with the oriental pragmatism and the vice versa right that is how a mixed culture develops in greece and that is very interesting to find out and in this juncture when alexander was ascending and descending after that and when rome was falling down right and christianity was slowly rising and you must be knowing that kolasar was delivering on that because of the rise of christianity the greek you now the philosophy of greek civilization went back went to a dark chamber and that is called a middle middle age we we can understand that the dark period of history history of ideas right so that is called the rise of christianity so what happened when christianity actually rose in greece the greek civilization or the philosophical aspect of uh, greece actually pushed back pushed back to the eternity right it was preserved in arabian countries and that is a very interesting thing and from arab it was again reaching to uh, uh, greece by the uh, the process of renaissance right that i'll i'll discuss and of course kolasar was discussing that when this renaissance happens in greece what happened people started new vibe to study the classical text classical text of greece and that is that is how what happened now there is a kind of mixed culture in one hand we have christianity in another hand we have alexander's civilization another hand we have no uh, of, of course there is another factor that was happening that is called birth of modern science right this is the time when science was uh, slowly developing and you know that how science and christianity was antagonistic to each other and you you must be also knowing that how these two civilizations were fighting two modes of looking at the world were fighting 
right science at one hand and christianity at another hand they were fighting with each other right and because christianity had lots of power therefore many of the scientists like for example bruno bruno was burn you know uh, live on the street right there are many other scientists like vesendi other scientists they were they were li you know burnt lively this is how the torture that was going going on against the scientists right even you talk about galileo now galileo was made to confess that he went mad right he said that what i have done what i have uh, known through the microscope and all the scientific processes went wrong because i went mad right this is what uh, no due to christianity so this is a time which was really a confusing time confusing time in history of ideas so we had three at least antagonistic forces one is in one hand classical text by greek civilizations in another hand we had christian christianity christian theology that was in uh, forefront and in another hand science was slowly you know moving increasing rising right and then of course people has to be confused today also we are confused right when this corona comes people become confused some of the people they went to went to temples that have prabhu rakha kara save me god save me but then the state actually closed the temples now people confused whom to call is it the state which is going to save me or the god which is going to save me or the doctors who are going to save me the same thing happened during that time also so at the one hand greek greek civilization that was reviving at another hand christianity was trying to dominate the intelligentsia the psyche of intelligentsia and at another hand science was rising slowly and speedily and human beings were at the confusion what to do whom to believe right who is telling the truth that is the question now it is in for forefront and therefore appears at this juncture actually appears francis bacon you might have heard about him francis bacon was a philosopher by passion but by profession he was an administrator so he held a very good position in uh, britain right so administration demanded one kind of attitude it's not philosophical attitude not theoretical attitude right administration demands more experiential attitude right it's not theoretical attitude it's experiential attitude you must know what is the truth and then you have to take a decision francis bacon was doing that so because of his administrative role administrative capacity and that actually influenced his philosophical career therefore what happened he talked about something what is that he asked this question how do i know because there are different different types of knowledge now how do i know can you now the uh, find out the shift the shift was the first question was people were engaged in the question what is this now they are turning shifting by the mouth of francis bacon that how do i know how to know because there are different types of knowledge i have christianity is saying something science is saying something right and the classical texts are saying something greek civilization no greek uh, people are saying something so what to know how to decide what is right knowledge what is true knowledge so this is the next question and for francis bacon knowledge is power right and therefore it is more important to understand the right knowledge find out the right knowledge because unless and until you don't understand the right knowledge you cannot lead a good life and therefore they asked of course francis bacon asked knowledge do because knowledge is power i must understand what is the right knowledge right and therefore he asked this question and this is how now the shift comes from metaphysics to epistemology what is this to how do i know this right so that is what is the question epistemology and how francis bacon started 
Francis Bacon actually, Bacon has a baggage. He said that my mind is like a bag. My mind is like a bag. That bag is already full, full with all kinds of idols, right? I, as I said, that human mind was full with all these different kinds of knowledge, you know, provided by different kinds of activities, like Christianity was giving us one kind of knowledge, right? And then Greek philosophers were giving us one kind of knowledge. And then science was giving us another kind of knowledge, right? Now, Bacon asks, my mind is full with all these. How can I know the real knowledge? If my mind is full, my bag is full, full with idols, right? Then what to do? I have to throw them out. If I want to really find out a new knowledge, then I have to find out, I have to throw it out, cast them out, the already knowledge I have from different sources. Different sources, particularly from Christianity, from Greek philosophers, right? So what I have to do, I have to just throw them out, cast them out, so that I can have you no know, right knowledge or new knowledge. And for that, what do we have to do? We have to become a, become a child, right? We have to become a children. Innocent, so innocent. You no, know, when a child encounters a thing, encounters anything, right? He or she encounters with blank, blank mind. He doesn't know anything. And therefore, children ask lots of questions. They ask lots of questions. What is this? What is that? They are not satisfied. They simply go on asking questions because their mind is blank. They approach a thing with complete innocence. And why we grown-ups, adult people, don't ask questions? Because we know that we know many things. We assume that we know many things. And therefore, we don't want to know another knowledge. And Bacon actually said that if you want to get real knowledge, true knowledge, new knowledge, then you have to become again children, kids. And therefore, you have to become innocent, innocent of isms and all the abstractions which philosophers have put to you. And I think you, you are aware of all these things like idols of tribe, idols of cave, idols of the marketplace, idols of the theater, right? And I don't want to discuss them in detail because it is already discussed. But I, let me let me tell you what what are these. Bacon believes that these are different kinds of knowledge already injected to us, to our mind from different sources. Now, if we want to have, you know, new knowledge, what we have to do? We have to throw them out. And this is just very simple. You have a pen drive now, right? So you people are more techno savvy. I know that. Suppose your pen drive is full with files and you want to have another file. What do you, what do you have to do? You have to delete some of the files, some of the obsolete files, some of the old files which we don't use. Unless and until you cast them out, how can you get another new file? Similarly, Bacon said that unless and until we cast them our old notions from our mind, then we cannot get new knowledge. And that is what is Bacon. And Bacon said, therefore, you must open your senses. And the method he induced to us is method of induction, right? And I won't discuss detail uh, what is method of induction, but I would simply say that Bacon was introducing the method of induction in the sense that he was banking upon the sense experience again. So you simply experience, examine, and then try to find out whether that is true or false. Don't believe who said. Don't believe on the Pope. Don't believe on the Christianity. Don't believe on the classical text. Don't believe anyone else. Simply believe on your sense, sense organs, right? And then you make, a, make an experiment. The experiment of enumeration, classification, elimination, and explanation. These are the four methods through which you can find new knowledge. So this is what, uh, you know, Bacon's, you know, uh, idea. 
and therefore i have written the heading if you can see that is light the lamp so when you light the lamp automatically darkness goes away shades away similarly you just open your mind you just open your eyes your ear everything you just open them then new knowledge will come new knowledge will be stored on you don't bank upon your old notions so that is what is bacon's bacon's most important contribution now but sometimes i cheat us i see that the sea or the ocean is you know attached with the sky somewhere i see it i see that in front of me there is a river flowing in a very sunny day but then when i reach there i find this is only bare land bare road but i see us sometimes i see us and therefore what happened enters rationalists but mind it people are now more concerned about how do i get a better knowledge people are not more concerned about what to know whether this life is true or that life is true whether this world is true or that world is true whether this world of reality is true or the world of ideas is true people are not more concerned about that now people are more concerned that how do i know whatever i know how do i know and this is how rationalists actually interfere because sometimes our eyes deceive us cheat us right and therefore these rationalist people came and you know that who are they descartes spinoza and leibniz these people came to the front as rationalist rationalist people started with you no know, set up their journey with this man descartes and of course descartes doubt and descartes believed that if we want to find a real knowledge a true knowledge certain knowledge now mind it we are, i am using different kinds of adjectives to knowledge and we will discuss later on what are they why they are different true knowledge certain knowledge right real knowledge these are different adjectives i am using now this man is saying look this descartes is saying in order to believe what we have to do is we have to doubt everything because our eyes somewhere sometime our eyes not cheated us deceived us therefore what is the guarantee that today in front of me what i see is not a deception done by my eyes again so i cannot i cannot bank up on or believe my eyes blindly so what i have to do in order to find out the certain knowledge i have to doubt i have to doubt everything so rationalist journey actually started with this simple agenda that we have to doubt everything before believing now what was the engagement uh, of descartes descartes wanted to give a foundation to philosophy and why is that let me let me discuss why look philosophy was second second by these three people in one hand greek philosophers were giving a fabulous kind of uh, philosophical system in another hand christianity was giving us a very another kind of theologic explanation of this world completely opposite to each other and here science comes sometimes swinging with greek civilization sometimes swinging with christianity and this is uh, you no know, very horrific kind of and in in fact it is recorded that is called the terror of history that is called terror of history the because people are in dismay people are in great confusion and philosophy actually was suffered with this what is that philosophy lost its foundation because the greek philosophers they developed a kind of a very solid philosophical system which was second by christianity now christianity was completely smashed by science new science then actually philosophy lost everything philosophy lost its foundation and therefore descartes wanted to give a very good foundation to philosophy 
Why? Because he thought that unless and until philosophy doesn't bank upon a, doesn't establish on a very good foundation, no one can believe on philosophy. No one will read philosophy. So what we have to do? We have to give a very solid foundation. Then what should be the foundation? The foundation is mathematics. Now, Descartes says, let mathematics meddles. Math mathematics interferes. Because for Descartes, mathematical conclusions are purely certain, quite certain. It doesn't change. It doesn't change with anything else. right? And therefore, Descartes actually asked, that let mathematics comes to the aid of philosophy. Let mathematics gives a foundation to philosophy so that philosophical conclusions would be very, very solid, very, very certain. And why mathematics that I'll, 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 I'll say, you know, you know, quite a bit. Why mathematics? Because that, that I'll say. But what Descartes then say? What is the method, strategy? The strategy is we have to find some propositions which are very clear and distinct. Clear and distinct means what? Clear means it, it is so clear, so transparent that there should be no doubt to believe it. This is one. Whether our senses say it, whether anything else says it, doesn't matter. But it is so clear that by closing my eyes also I believe in it, on it. That is called a clear proposition. And what is distinct proposition? A distinct proposition is that which is not dependent on any other propositions. That is called a distinct proposition. It is just atomic, so simple proposition. It's very, very simple proposition, right? It doesn't depend on any other proposition. So that is what clear and distinct proposition. Descartes believed that if I can find out one or two or any, some, any, some clear and distinct propositions, which everyone will believe without doubt, then on, on that basis, I can deduce many other propositions. And that is how he employed deductive method. And the clear and distinct proposition he talked about were the axioms. He said that if we can find out some axioms, some clear and distinct propositions, which intuitively, without depending on our experience, we can believe. And in fact, we, we cannot help but believe it. That is what is called clear and distinct proposition, right? Our sense experience, right, cannot just reject it. So that is what is called uh, clear and distinct proposition. And if we can find it out from deductive method, deductive method, of course, is available in Greek uh, philosophy. So we can find out that. And through that uh, deductive method, we can bring out other propositions. So this is Descartes' agenda. And therefore, he meditated on. He didn't, he don't, he didn't go to the world to find out what is true knowledge, just like Bacon. Bacon was moving here and there, having a lamp. Right? Having a lamp in the day, in the day, during the day, during the night, he was searching in the world around to find out true knowledge. But Descartes, Descartes didn't go anywhere, didn't venture to the world. Simply he slept. And you are, uh, you are surprised to know that Descartes is famous for his good sleep. He was sleeping up to two o'clock in the afternoon. Right? He was sleeping up to two o'clock in the afternoon. He was having good wine, good food. He didn't have a job. Right? He, uh, he didn't have a he have an uh, university job. He simply, you know, uh, depended on his uh, hiring. And then he slept, meditated on, dreamt. And from that, he found this. He thought that there is at least one proposition which everyone has to believe, even closing their eyes. Even, do not, even though they don't depend on their sense experience, they have to believe on it. That is, I think, therefore I am. What is that? No one can doubt that they, they, they are, he is thinking. Because thinking itself, doubting itself is a process of thinking. Right? So if he's, he's, he says that I am doubting, means he's thinking. 
so no one can deny that that he is not thinking so the moment he says that i am doubting he has to agree that he is thinking now if he is thinking that means he has to exist unless and until he exists how can he think and how can he doubt so that is why decart reaches this proposition he says that this proposition i think therefore i am it's so simple so clear so distinct that no one can reject it no one can refute it either by sense organs or by mind by reason whatever no one can reject it this is a very simple very clear and distinct proposition now got it this is the one proposition from which now he is he has to build the whole philosophy i think therefore i am and when i exist the next moment he has to prove is that god exists and there is whole debate whole you know arguments decarts provides why god exists i don't want to venture into it again because i don't want to bore you this has been discussed in a very detailed way how god exist is proved from my existence so from my existence he proves that god exists from existence of the god he proves that the world exists and from the when the existence of world is confirmed then he proves that my body also exists this is how he moves and therefore i said that rationalist actually made a resort resort of ideas from one simple proposition they are making the whole resort the whole philosophy out of it even venturing out to the world from mind only from connection from if this is this then this will happen if this will happen then this, that will happen if that will happen then that will happen they will continue and they will create the whole of fabulous system of philosophy this is how he did so the question which greek philosophers asked now if if it is asked to decarts decarts would say who exist what is what exist who are ex who are they their god and body and mind so these three things exist god god body and mind i don't want to discuss that again and then you know that decarts was talking about dualism body exists and mind also exists and his dualism is beautifully right manifested in this what is mind no matter what is matter never mind so this is how he enters to a dualism decarts enters to a dualism and at this he stops that god exists as the supreme let me come to again decarts okay god exists as the ultimate subs substance but body and mind they do exist depending on the god right in this way what decart did let me tell you decart was a scientist remember one thing i was saying bruno was murdered brutally galileo was confessed right bassendi was murdered now decart could not dare to go against christianity he could not say that god doesn't exist he could not say it even though he doesn't he he doesn't want to say this but he could not say it and therefore he has to take a middle path he said yes god exists god created everything but after the creation god left and very popularly he said that right god created this world and after that he threw this dice dice is the world and the world operates by itself just like a clock and therefore it is called the clock universe our universe is a clock universe clock universe means for the first time the clock maker creates a clock and then pulls the you no know, key on it and when the clock operates for the first time and then the clock the clock maker vanishes and the clock operates by itself similarly decart says that the god was there god created everything body mind everything but after that he left he just left and he he just you no know, gave the world to run by itself in this way what decart did decart made christianity happy now when christianity popes would say hey decarts 
do you believe in god he says yes i believe in god do you believe that god has created everything yes i do believe in god has created everything then decart says that okay god has created everything but after that he is silent now it is our duty scientist duty to understand the world how it operates and ch to change it moderate it and this is how decart actually you no know, made happy both of them the christianity and the scientists okay and therefore decart also said that body or the physical universe should be discussed by science mind as a spiritual entity spiritual substance should be discussed and studied by theology and philosophy so this is a very wonderful you know contract he made a very wonderful contract sab log khush ho gaye sab log happy this is how spino but here actually enters spinoza spinoza didn't stop there spinoza thought that if if decart is really true if decart is really faithful to his method the method of doubt the method of deductive logic then he cannot stop in dualism he cannot stop believing that body and mind they are both separately existing he cannot do that because logic doesn't permit it why if you understand the the definition of a substance and that is that is again the decart's method that you have to understand the first clear and distinct proposition and the most clear and distinct proposition is the substance the substance is that which doesn't depend on anything it is self caused and self fulfilled and if it is true if this definition is true if this cartesian definition is true then how can you believe on two different entities body and mind there could be only one that is god of course spinoza won't talk about god spinoza would say there is only one substance and then 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 this body and mind whom decart was talking about decart was talking about two entities they are simply qualities of this one entity one substance they are not substance independent substance these are simply two attributes of the same entity that is spinoza and therefore he declared that dualism is really very difficult unity is universal so there is only one entity one substance that could be only known that could be only known through deductive logic the world exists and god and i simply exist so for spinoza god doesn't exist i don't exist only the nature exists only one substance exists okay spinoza would say i will not mind if you say that substance is god i will not mind and if you say that that substance is nature i won't mind but you say that there is only one reality you cannot say there are two realities in fact decart was talking about three realities it is not possible spinoza said that if decart is faithful to his method then he cannot believe in three three substances he has to believe in one substance only that might be nature that might be god that might be spirit whatever but that is one only so unity is the truth duality is difficult and therefore he declared another i won't discuss that in detail otherwise my time will be over i am conscious about that also and he said what exist one in many and many in one that is how he bridges the gap between this dualism so there is only one entity that is manifested manifested in many and there are many this diversity but actually that is one this is spinoza and here enters another rationalist taking this reason seriously taking this axiom seriously and deductive method seriously he says if spinoza is true and if decart is not true then what happens that one 
remember that Descartes was saying matter, the essential characteristic of matter or body is extension. Right? And if it is extension, then it is passive. So matter is passive. For liveness, matter is passive. But in this world, you, you find life. And life is not passive. Life is active. And from there, from where then this life or activity comes from a passive matter. So this is how logic gives us. This is how deductive logic proves that if you are saying that matter is passive, then how can from a passive matter active life comes? It is not possible. Logically, this is not possible because we know that our mind says, our reason says that nothing great comes from lesser. The effect cannot be less than the cause. Right? Or more than the cause. That is the, that is the idea. So activity cannot come from the passivity. Therefore, matter is not there. Matter doesn't exist. The whole world, the whole universe is a grand design. So the whole universe is a design, a spiritual design, a forceful design, or energetic design. It is already harmonized. It is a very subtle, delicate, complex design. You cannot just simply say that matter, and you know that what Descartes and all scientists that, that again says, that matter, because they are passive, matter moves randomly. It doesn't have an order. It moves randomly, right? Leibniz says that this is not possible. The whole universe, if you look at it, if you just perceive the whole world, then you will find there is a subtle and a very grand design operating in it. And it is not possible in a very random and chaotic matter. The matter which is randomly moving, they cannot create a very perfect world. And therefore, we have to believe on a substance which is very, very spiritual, very, very intelligent, very, very active. Look how the axioms and the deductive method takes to us, leads to us. Right? So this is how Leibniz. Then how do I know? OK, epistemology again intensifies. This is Leibniz. Leibniz says that there is a, there is a very, very sophisticated, intelligent creator of this world. Do you believe on it? Do you experience that? There is a very, you know, very intelligent boy standing there or sitting there who is creating everything all the harmonies all the you no know, movements everything is designed by an intelligent you know intelligent designer an architect is it possible how to know that so the next moment again will come epistemology will again intensify condense you no know? that is they will ask hello before you say this, that there is an intelligent designer, before you say that there is only one thing, before you say that there are three things, just tell us how do you know that. So check your net before you fish. So if you want to f catch some fish from a pond, before that you just check your net from which you are going to catch the fish. Is it right? Is there any hole in it? then you cannot catch any fish. So again, epistemology revives, comes by the you know, empiricist eyes. It comes with these three wonderful people, Locke, Buckley, and Hume. These three people will come. They will ask, say, look, rationalist, enough. You are talking about substance. You are talking about intelligent designer. You are talking about God. You are talking about body, mind, this, that, blah, blah. How do you know that? By your reason. But how do you know that reason even operates? So tell us the methods of knowing. 
This is how the empiricist actually interferes, intrudes to the discussion. And the discussion starts with this man, John Locke. And he brings us a locker. You have no bank locker. Similarly, Locke brings a locker. He says that our mind is just like a locker. Of course, an empty locker. But the locker is empty. Our mind is empty. And it has only one door. Only one door. What is that? That is, of course, sense organs. Now, Locke believes that our mind is blank. Our mind is a blank chamber, blank, empty locker. It doesn't have anything. And it has only one open door. And that, that, that door is the sensation or the sense organs. And then what do you do? Close that door, the world will disappear. This is what, because that is the only way, only method through which we can know anything, whether that is God, whether that is the designer, whether that is body, mind, whatever. We have to bank upon only one door, only one source, that is our sense organs. And if you are not banking on that sense organs, you know nothing. So that is how Locke interferes. And here comes a very interesting riddle that I call Rose Riddle. And I introduce this Rose Riddle to my students in my classes. Let me also introduce this, the Rose Riddle. What is that? The riddle goes like this. The rose is red. The rose is red, therefore it looks red. Or the rose looks red, therefore it is red. This is a question for you. Think a little bit. But let me go back again, Locke. We know that the, I said that the close the door, the world disappears. And you know that how um, Locke describes on innate, uh, innate ideas, refutes innate ideas. And then he says about primary qualities, secondary qualities. And then he, sec he talks about abstract ideas, simple ideas and all. I don't want to discuss them in detail. But what actually Locke was doing, Locke was simply saying, that look, whatever exists, it will exist only when it will be perceived. And beyond my perception, I don't know whether that really exists or that doesn't exist. And therefore, Locke was talking about the substance, I know not what. So that is, that is the definition for Locke. The substance is that I know not what. I don't know because I don't perceive it. My sense organs do not give us any sense data about substance. Because whenever I see something, I see a table. I don't see a table really. I see qualities. I see a color. I see brown color or I see a shape or I see a, a size. I don't see the table. Right? So therefore, because sense organs are only source of our knowledge, therefore, I cannot know what is the substance. And John Locke was so humble that he said, look, I don't bother also. I don't bother what exists there beyond my sense organs. I bother what it looks. How does it look to me? Okay? So that is what Locke. And this is how we found this, the rose riddle. And he said the rose is red, therefore it looks red. Or the rose looks red, therefore it is red. This is a very interesting riddle. You must think over that. And you have to give the answer <laughs> when question answer session will be there. OK. And this actual, the same, this question was taken up by another empiricist, Buckley. And Buckley actually created a bungalow out of it. He said, look, if Locke is right, and if you take Locke seriously, and if that is true, that we can know only the qualities, we can know only through our sense organs, then matter doesn't exist. And that is what is the famous reputation of immaterialism propounded by Buckley. So what I, I am very sure, I am very sure about my sense, sensations ideas because whenever i see a thing i see 
or I find a sensation, a sensation of a color, a sensation of a size, a sensation of a shape, or a sensation of a test, all of them are ideas. So I am very certain about my ideas. I am not certain about the matter because matter doesn't come to my sense organs. And therefore what he said, matter is not perceived. So matter went away. And therefore I close my eyes. When I close my eyes, the world vanishes. Okay. But one thing is very sure. That is, I perceive, therefore I exist. I perceive whatever I, I perceive, therefore I exist. Because my sensations are there. Right? So ideas only exist. This is how idealism was created. And therefore I re, ro, uh, no, wrote there Buckley and his bungalow. Right? He created a bungalow out of it. Uh, ideal, whole idealism, a brand new philosophy comes. Idealism. Right? And here inter, now enters another Hume and his whim. Very interesting. Hume and his whim. Now Hume says, oh my God, Locke and Buckley, they were doing very good thing. John Locke was doing one thing and Buckley cut him down by a, by a sword. What is that? The matter was cut, broken away, smashed by perception. Right? Now Hume says that because matter is not perceived, therefore Buckley said matter doesn't exist. Now, Buckley believes that I exist. A spiritual entity exists. Does Buckley perceive the spiritual entity? No. The answer is no. Even we don't experience my soul. I don't experience myself. Simply I experience sporadic ideas, sporadic kind of sensations. In fact, Hume calls it impressions, right? Sporadic ideas. I simply stumble upon sporadic ideas here and there. I never meet the soul. So the logic by which matter was smashed, the same logic actually destroyed mind. So Hume actually destroyed everything. Hume destroyed matter. Hume destroyed, actually Buckley destroyed matter. Hume destroyed mind. So nothing left. No matter, never mind. Never mind. Okay? Nothing left. And if nothing left, what to believe? What to believe? What is the true knowledge? Hume, this is how enters to a very, very scourging kind of skepticism. And he asks this question, will the sun rise tomorrow? There is no guarantee. Because whatever I see, I see today at this moment. I don't know whether the next thing, next moment I, I, I go to perceive it or not. So I cannot say anything about tomorrow. I can say simply about now. And if it is true, then will the sun rise tomorrow? This is how philosophy was destroyed, science was destroyed, Christianity was destroyed, nothing was left. Hume actually gave us a very devastating blow. But then, of course, the sun rises. And the sun rose. The sun rose with the rises of Kant, the philosopher. Kant comes as the sun rises every day. Even though Hume says that I don't know, but that doesn't matter. Sun rises in the next morning. And as the sun rises in the next morning, the next philosopher rises in the form of Kant. The Kant comes. But Kant comes with the goggles. Kant and his Kala Chasma, black goggles. Kant comes with a black goggles. What is that? Let's discuss. But let me tell you that. What Kant said, Kant found that, look, rationalists are like spiders. Let's imagine, remember again, 
what is that rationalist rational rationalists are like spiders imagine a spider you just think about a spider what a spider does spider actually brings out a very brilliant a very you no know, magnificent kind of net from its own body very one body you no know? it doesn't go anywhere and makes a huge net huge house right from its own from its own body and similarly kant believes that rationalist also did like that rationalist thought that we can prove everything we can know everything only depending on our reason we should not go anywhere we should simply depend on our reason and we can know anything everything that is what is you no know, rationalist are like spiders moving and then comes empiricist right and kant believes that empiricist are like ants ants do not do anything do not create anything simply they gather they gather from everywhere they gather from everywhere they do not create anything they simply gather and you know collect from everywhere and gather save them and lock buckle and hume they are empiricist they are like ants they believe that our mind is just like ant it cannot create anything it simply look collects informations from outside and gathers and mind is just a dump yard mind is just so passive or dump yard or dustbin simply you collect information gather there just like an ant does this is not like that kant believes this is not true our mind is not like spider our mind is not like ant either our mind is like a honey bee look how a honey bee does honey bee look collects collects no nectar from the flowers right collects without the collection we cannot find honey but what it collects it is not honey also honey bee works on it honey bee transforms it right does lots of modification on the nectar he brings from the outside and then he creates a new creation that is honey honey is not the nectar he brought similarly our, our mind is also like that our mind doesn't create everything from itself neither our mind brings everything from outside and doesn't do anything our mind collects <coughs> sorry our mind collects information from outside but then it works upon it i'm sorry it works upon it it works through its categories this is how kant talks about transcendental aesthetics and transcendental analytics right what he does he says that our mind collects information through our sense organs like empiricists believe true but it doesn't simply produce that as it brings it uses its categories categories are there in our mind right they operate on the sensations the sensations are raw they cannot be no they could not be eaten directly knowledge cannot be produced from that raw wild kind of sensations it should be processed it should be cooked properly then only it, it could be a you know knowledge and that is how kant actually makes an assimilation assimilation between experience as well as reason does a wonderful job right and therefore he he is said to be a copernicus in philosophy because he brings a completely you know new kind of idea that our our mind is not passive but our mind is also not a uh, you know uh, samrat dictator right it is not passive but it is not also dictator it cannot create anything whatever by by its whim no it is not like that 
so it has to bring it has to depend on the senses when the sense organs collect some sensations mind works on it and then the final products become the knowledge and that knowledge is true but kant again brings lots of twists to that what about that let's discuss it and therefore kant says that before you tell anything try to find out a new knowledge about anything you just check your net because as your net so is your fish right if you go to catch fish with a bigger hole no bigger hole net then you cannot cannot catch smaller fish because they will go out similarly even though our mind has lots of categories it cannot create the knowledge by itself it has to depend on the senses but when it depends on senses it has another two net they are space and time so our senses come through this space and time those space and time actually make the sense sensations ready to process to be processed in the chamber through categories okay so that is the net he was talking about now so the world is as you see or as you perceive through your goggles so that is how kant i was saying that kant was wearing a goggles you just imagine if you wear a goggles red goggles then the whole world is looked seen as red to you and now just imagine if you from your birth come with a goggles you never see anything without that goggles then the world looks like that only the goggles what the goggles says right so kant actually could not find out open out that goggles throughout his life and therefore he says we we have a limit of knowledge our knowledge has a limit because our goggles has a limit the goggles cannot catch everything the goggles has a limit it can only extend to the phenomenon world phenomena so the goggles can only give us the idea or knowledge about this world the world of phenomena the world of perception the world of sensation and i cannot see anything beyond it because my goggles doesn't permit therefore kant says don't say anything about the beyond world you simply talk about this world only so your knowledge has a limit your knowledge has a limit to phenomena only beyond that if there is a world if at all there is a world i cannot know anything i cannot know anything about that but should i declare like lock that it is unknowable is it unknowable kant says no 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 it cannot be unknowable it it might be unknowable but it cannot be sayable therefore it can be simply believed it should be believed only faith can operate there knowledge cannot so knowledge can operate in this world only we can talk about this world and we can say true or false only about this world and when we go beyond it just like god just like self they actually are beyond this world therefore you don't never say true or false about them you simply can say that whether you believe it or you don't believe it but never say whether that is true or false so science let science studies phenomena let theology studies that faith nomena he talks about that nomena that world beyond that world beyond this world there is another world that is called nomena but that nomena about that nomena we cannot say anything science cannot say anything let theologist enter to there right let faith enters there but let science doesn't no venture to that so let theology studies faith and what philosophy has to do 
no one should meddle in other that means science should not enter to study god soul and other similarly theology should not talk about body theology should not talk about this world no one should interfere into anyone's field theology should operate in another world science should operate in another world then what philosophy has to do philosophy kon karyo philosophy has to ensure that these people are not crossing the limits and whenever anyone cross its boundary philosophy has to check it that look you are crossing now the your boundary stop check your movement that is the task of philosophy and therefore philosophy or kant's philosophy is called criticism and criticism has a very notorious name many people believe that criticism means critical complex no 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 allegations no criticism has another name also systematic philosophy criticism means systematic philosophy kant says that everything should be systematized nothing should be in mess science should not enter to enter to in uh, that that field where it should not enter similarly theology should not enter to that field where it should not enter every should be everyone should you know follow a system therefore this is systematic so criticism is a systematic study everything at its own systematic place so kant makes it kant says that don't interfere so philosophy has to do that philosophy has to ensure that no one is interfering in another's field and then what is task for us so this is kant up to kant what is the task for us what do we have to do ame kon kare we have to do what do we have to do in fact the rest of the western philosophers starting from hegel bradley bergson or schopenhauer nietzsche anyone you talk about any name you just talk any name in western philosophy what they are doing and what we philosophers next generation philosophers have to do that is what is our task our task is simply make that goggles that black goggles kant's goggles whiter it is it is too black let's make it whiter right so that we can see better and brighter thank you thank you very much thank you very much sir dekha uh, devasis i think i i finished my talk by time right yes sir yes sir oh, <laughs> and and the good thing is that no one bored as i have already told that your lecture is so engaging your lecture is really so engaging that no one feels bored even for a single minute <laughs> Oh, thank you thank you thank you speaking on western philosophy in one uh, one single dose is really difficult <laughs> yeah it is but uh, you made it so simple in a such a simple way uh, how you present this is excellent so thank, <laughs> thank you, you. <laughs> yeah thank you very much sir for your nice presentation uh, for a very engaging lecture So now I request Madam Nibirita Priyadar Singh to moderate the session. If uh, some question and queries, you can post there in the chat box, and Nibirita Ma'am will put to one by one to sir. So Nibirita Ma'am, are you there? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am here. Thank you, sir. um thank you sir uh, for your wonderful presentation it was so simple so clearly explained uh, before i begin this question answer session i must say i can uh, see so much of compliments coming from the all the participants who are listening you in fact i learned a lot from your teaching and from your understanding sir thank it was you. so excellent uh, thank you nivedita the presentation even the presentation was so innovative that i just want this session to be continue and don't stop So thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, now I will begin with this uh, uh, question session. I think there is only two questions till now. Uh, one is from uh, K O Narayan, sir. Uh, okay. He asked, uh, "Did Berkeley say I perceive, therefore I exist?" 
or i perceive an object therefore the object exist or both yeah i will go with the last one or both right <laughs> or both because i i i used in a you know very dramatic way of course <laughs> therefore therefore might be the confusion the confusion is look buckley was believing that there is someone behind us to perceive so he was uh, just assuming it that that exists right and it is not possible right whenever you say that someone is perceiving that means you are assuming, assuming the existence of that perceiver isn't it so that perceiver is already there for buckley thought that that spiritual entity is already there because it perceives without it perception is not possible and since the perception is continuing going on therefore the perceiver also continues to exist so that was what buckley right and therefore what he believes at the last he believes that i as a perceiver exist there is no doubt on that and whatever i perceive that exist and if i don't perceive anything then i don't uh, nothing exist but then i perceive myself because the perception itself exist therefore i exist all the time okay thank you sir uh, the next question is from narayan behra sir uh, he asked does kant's philosophy is regulative in nature okay i became a little bit uh, yeah uh, please repeat are uh, and narayan behra sir asked that dutch kant's philosophy is regulative in nature regulative uh, in which sense narayan sir um, might be thinking regulative in the sense if if you are saying regulative means that philo philosophy has to um, regulate or dominate or uh, fixes the norms of science then it is not it is really not if uh, that is the meaning of uh, sorry if my voice is clear someone wrote my voice is not clear yes sir your voice is clear it's clear okay, okay. Clear. so if narayan sir uses uh, regulative uh, in the sense that it controls then it is not kant's theory is not kant's uh, philosophy is not uh, regulative in that sense if regulative means narayan sir believes that regulative means that uh, uh it it fixes the norms of operation then it is regulative in the sense because uh, as um, kant's philosophy is also otherwise known as transcendental philosophy right transcendental philosophy means in one sense of transcendental philosophy means that because of that this happens right so that that is the sense of transcendentality so if that is the idea that means if philosophy is there then science operates so in that sense regulative it is regulative but it doesn't control simply kant says that it has to it has to look that science should not cross its field of operation that is that is the simple theory right it has its own uh, field of operation science has to operate within that boundary it should not do that it, it should not cross and kant uh, says that when it crosses the boundary right then uh, no it it mistakes it right? commits lots of mistakes so it should not do that and regulative is not in the sense hitler's regulation right if you don't do this if you cross the boundary then i will give you punishment no kant's philosophy is not like that kant's philosophy simply says that what is one's boundary it simply uh, now shows us what is the boundary for our operation that's all yeah okay thank you sir uh, the next question is from nanda go sir how can we make kant goggle brighter <laughs> yeah <laughs> very interesting question and i am also doing that um, i am writing in fact i am engaged in a, a book uh, on that i am writing on the recent uh, western philosophers like schopenhauer nietzsche who who have done a little bit work beyond kant so i would invite nanda ghos madam or sir uh, to cooperate with me we can do it and sir he also asked another question that where to place space and time are they the glasses 
if so then how does the color matter do you have any other con uh, connotation attached to the black color okay no black color black color was just a simile forget about that what i was saying the glass is not transparent that is the idea the glass is not transparent it is colored and when it is colored that means whatever i see through that that colored glass i will uh, i will see that things only that color so you just look if your your glass is red your goggles is red if you are wearing a goggles uh, red goggles then you see a white chalk but uh, the chalk appears to be red that's that's the problem so it doesn't matter with color it matters that the goggles actually distorts my vision that's what i am i am not getting the real view what i want to get because of this uh, glass so therefore i have to you now erase that color from that so that i can see the uh, see the glass clearly so see the thing clearly right so it might be black it might be red it might be doesn't matter but it should not be transparent the glass is not transparent for can't can't believe that the glass is not transparent and that is the most misfortune or unfortunate uh, unfortunate uh, thing i could find about kant and i am trying my best how to make that transparent uh, transparent okay thank you uh, thank you sir the next yes. question is from mona lisa sahu i don't know what she asked she asked uh, what bacon said about how we can intentionally withdraw our existing knowledge in order to get new knowledge yeah <laughs> very good very good this is a, this is this is really very good question i said that bacon's uh, engagement started with casting away all the idols he said that all the idols were already there they were put into our mind uh, already there right they were already there and until and unless they are cast away they are thrown away from my bag how can i bring another new thing to my uh, inside the bag so i have to cast them Anyway, right now how to do it actually bacon stopped there bacon did not do anything more on that bacon simply said light the lamp right bacon simply said light the lamp when you light the lamp then automatically other things will go away disappear and new knowledge will come so that is a simile but what he he does he says that you know that you have lots of baggages lots of idols in your mind but don't believe on that so that is the first step don't believe on that then whom to believe deliberately you believe on your sense organs so that is the simile used for light the lamp right so he used that but uh, this um, this project has been taken off seriously by the next uh, philosophers like phenomenologist philosophers they are doing excellent job how to cast away all those baggages so that that actually takes lots of time so i should not enter to that bacon did not do that bacon simply said that you just simply say whatever theory is there whatever abstraction is there whatever i know forget that you do and you simply believe on your eyes or sense organs so this is the simple thing bacon did but it is so simple uh, you can say it is so simple but later philosophers actually developed on that you will uh, if you if you read continental philosophy you have a, a clear idea how they do it cast away all the abstractions okay thank, thank you, you sir the next question is by prashant kumar aruka uh, he asked you said the cause cannot be less than the cause please clarify in what sense cannot be less the tree is bigger than the seed <coughs> Oh. <laughs> okay very interesting uh, uh the tree is bigger than the seed yeah yes. but the tree the seed is not the cause <laughs> that is the question okay the seed is not the uh, cause no no sir Whatever. he asked you said the cause cannot be the yeah. less uh, cause cannot ha, be less ha, than I, the seed. I I, I I understand. Hmm. Means the the simple idea is that if you if you bring two two liters of milk, right? Two liters of milk, and then you want to have cord, then the cord, what do you get? 
cannot be more than 2 liters of uh, 2 liters of uh, milk right so the the effect cannot be more than the cause it can be equal but cannot be more than the cause so that is the that is the traditional view of uh, the relationship between cause and effect right cause and effect with uh, uh, the traditional relationship is that the effect cannot be uh, greater than the cause and it is quite logical also how can you so find out Yes. Sorry, sir, to interrupt. Uh, he uh, uh, he has uh, also cleared that it was uh, it was effect. Cause cannot be less than the effect. It was just a typing mistake. Yeah. yeah, that that is then then it's okay. So I said that effect has to be because effect cannot be better than the cause. No, but idea is uh, that we we have a very clear and distinct perception again, intuition again is that nothing comes out of nothing. Right. So effect, if effect becomes larger than the cause, then this violates that intuition that something comes out of nothing. Right. If three kilo of cord comes out of two kilo of milk, then at least one kilo of cord comes out of nothing. Isn't it? And that is a logical uh, contradiction. So that is that is why I said that effect cannot be more than the cause. It can be equal, but it cannot be more than the cause. Okay, I think uh, I'm, I'm clear. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Strabani Alpana. She wants to know. Even I also wants to know this question. Whose philosophy you might want to follow personally? Ah, uh, this is a difficult question, Strabani. I can tell you this question personally. <laughs> okay, sir. My personal, yeah, my personal choices can be discussed personally. <laughs> I should not discuss here. Okay, thank you, Varda. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, question. We will discuss later. So this is a secret. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Pramod Kumar Das, sir. Please clarify how Deka said that world exists, therefore body exists, as you said in order of existence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. <clears throat> the idea is if go, uh, if you go through the the whole uh, system of uh, Descartes, uh, no evolution. What what happens? He first establishes. No, he he first destroys everything, right? And then first he establishes my mind means as a spiritual entity I exist. Okay. Now he says that. Because I exist, and I have an innate idea of God, and this idea of God is not created by me, right? And that is the same logic that effect cannot be more than the cause. So if I am the effect, my existence is the effect. So I can be less than no, I cannot be more than the cause, right? So that is the idea. So the cause must be more than the effect, okay? And in that way. I am not the cause of my existence. So there's something more which is, which causes me, and that is God. So in that way, God's existence is confirmed, right? Now, when God's uh, existence is confirmed, He says another. So uh, mind it, for Descartes, he has three kinds of ideas, right? One is innate ideas. Another is fictitious ideas. Another is adventitious ideas, right? Now, what about adventitious ideas? What is that? What is adventitious ideas? Descartes believes that these adventitious ideas come to me through my sense organs. So this is a very interesting thing. You have to note that, right? These adventitious ideas come to me through my sense organs. This doesn't come from my inner ideas. So I am not the cause of this, right? I am not the cause of this idea. These ideas, I am not the cause. Then who is the cause? Definitely, God is the cause, because I exist and God exists. No one else exists. Do you understand that? Now the connection is that if I exist and God exists and I have certain ideas which are not caused by myself, then who created them? Definitely, God has created them. So God created those things about which I get the idea. 
urban cisius idea so nature existed right nature existed the universe existed world existed okay and then decart also says just like the idea of a tree is an adventitious idea i get it from outside similarly my idea of my hand or idea of my leg right are also adventitious idea these are not innate ideas right so these are uh, these ideas are also come from outside of myself and if it is it comes from outside that means it is the part of the natural world because natural world now exist first i existed then god existed and because i have adventitious ideas of trees mountain and other things so what happens that uh, god actually created them so nature existed now when nature existed i could find that i have another another uh, set of ideas they are about my my hand my leg my body right and because since nature has already been proved therefore descartes believes that this is also the part of the nature hello yes hello nepadita yes sir uh, can i speak yes, yes sir, sir yes sir you can yeah Uh, when i when we say that i think therefore i exist what is that i i means i am with my body and mind i exist means not only my mind exists i exist means i exist with my body and mind my body is not excluded from my mind because decart believes in both body and mind both in extension and a consciousness mm. so when decart claims that i think therefore i exist mm. what is that i who thinks what is that i that exists yes that yes. i that yeah. i that mm. i uh, means that uh, that my body and i exists with my body and mind my okay, body does understand. not my, my body does not exist after a world exists yes yeah. <laughs> man no yeah. okay okay man, i could understand man, yeah and first my mind exists then god exists then world exists then my body is joined to my mind no my i exist means mm. i exist with my body and mind so that matter is over then okay what is the, then what okay. is the cause of my my existence hmm. my existence means the um, what is the cause of the existence of my body and mind and soul then hmm. then my parents can be the cause of my body and mind but my parents cannot be the cause of my soul therefore god comes because god is infinite so okay. something infinite can be the or something the greater principle can be the cause of the uh, cause so, so uh, therefore god comes then uh, then world comes so matter this series ends there okay okay so i exist <laughs> therefore god exists therefore world exists but huh. uh, in your order hmm. uh, i saw the that after world exists body exists no this is uh, this is not my order this is actually decart's order decart's order in the sense that decart when decart said that i exist he never referred to body he simply referred to mind right means the uh, the spiritual entity exists and therefore somewhere he said that mind is just like a ghost in the machine so he he actually destroyed everything but fast he stumbled upon the mind as a spiritual entity body doesn't come to the uh, existence now simply mind exists mind has a separate entity mind has a independent existence Ma for decades mind exists by itself mind doesn't depend on the body to exist that is the dualism no my uh, decades talks about if De decades goes against it then his uh, dualism actually destroys But mind can exist 
without the help of body that is very no looks very sounds very abstract sounds very absurd also but that is the scheme of uh, decades and therefore many people they criticize decades but decades started with that that mind can exist by itself nobody nothing no no dependent if you say that when i exist i exist with body then that means i become dependent with body and that will be not allowed by decades decades would say then it will not be a substance because it is dependent on body and if body doesn't exist then i don't exist it is no then where does my mind exist ha uh, that is the ghost no decades says that is the ghost mind exist anywhere that is absurd now because uh, most of the scientists they they discuss they say that decart is absurd how can uh, a spirit uh, exist how can uh, spirit then, mind then, then 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 the decart should say yeah then decart should say the ghost thinks there would be ghost exists yes then what? that that i is ghost of course that i is ghost decart did not use it uh, spirit decart did not use it a god because god is spiritual god uh, no but god is also spiritual god exist <laughs> do you understand that so this is how decart says that mind can exist by itself therefore this is a substance acha okay okay sir we shall discuss later on yeah it's uh, uh, after, yeah. after after this uh, session yeah uh, because 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 here we are discussing something particular in this point um, i want to be enlightened actually Uh, yeah. if, if it is so um, yeah. uh, please uh, after this session uh, you can uh, you can uh, show me the reference where it is yeah. written yeah definitely thank i'll, I'll thank, you. thank you okay. thank you i mean i shall learn i shall learn yeah yeah i shall learn okay, okay. thank okay. you thank you yeah. nivedita any, any thank you sir uh, anything else yeah ha uh, yes sir yes uh, the next question is from ratnakara gajendra sir Yeah. He wants to know space and time are empirically real but transcendentally ideal. Space and time are two forms of a priori intuition. Please explain in the light of Kant's philosophy. Okay, it needs a, a lot of explanation. Um, <clears throat> in the sense, uh, what what uh, what Kant believes that uh, space and time both are look that is actually the twist of Kant. what say what it does space and time they are they they do not exist in the world so this is uh, this is interesting they exist in the mind right they exist in the mind but they operate in the world so that is uh, that is actually the uh, important line of kant that uh, whenever i find i find any sense data from sense organs so the sense data when they come they come to us right they come to us randomly and sporadically each one is different right each one is different now kant believes that how these sporadic sense sensations become perception ready to become no to be further processed by categories right so in between there are two faculties one is space and time and these are transcendental because without these two operations sensation cannot you no know, bring us cannot bring us the empirics or sense data sense datum so therefore this is a priori they operate so whenever i see a thing all the time i see a thing at a particular place from the distance of another thing so that is the space but that space doesn't exist in the outside of the world that that space is present in my mind this is a mode of my sensation mode of sensation but because that is there therefore i can see certain things kant believes that look there are many things in front of my eyes and that is also very practical when we walk on the road we find many uh, shops right many shops many people many things around but do we perceive everything no we perceive certain things how is it possible kant believes that 
if empirical empiricists are true that our sense organs are active they are very faithful they are very honest warriors they bring whatever they see outside of the world then i should get all the panorama all the views whatever came in front of my eyes but that that didn't happen how is it possible my eyes were open and all these things were there in front of my eyes but i did not uh, i did not receive everything i received some of them how does it happen and he says it happens because of space and time these are the mode of mode of sensations now our space and time actually channelizes our sense organs to receive or to see or perceive that what it wants to see right and that is why this is called transcendental transcendental therefore this is called a priori i think i am uh, i'm sufficient or else i'll i'll write it yeah later hello nivedita ma'am i think nivedita nivedita has gone yes. he she is left my sorry, sorry sir no 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 okay I'm okay Oh, yeah. so, okay, okay. I just muted the. Uh, okay, sir. The next question is from Sashwati Pallai. Um, she wants to know. Uh, she wants the clarification that how Deca said, "I exist, therefore God exists, and God exists, therefore world exists, and world exists, therefore body exists." Hmm. I think you have cleared. Ah, that that we discussed with Pramod sir. I think <laughs> that we discussed with Pramod sir. So I should not uh, discuss again. The idea is. that how how he constructs what he destroyed he destroyed everything first then he con constructed when he constructed he constructed with a principle the principle is no no nothing can come to the focus or to the table which was not spoken earlier right nothing can come to the table which is not spoken earlier or who is could not be deduced from the earlier proposition that you have to understand so when he destroyed and then constructed what he found first he found only i and now that what is the nature of that i that i is a spiritual entity and therefore he said i walk therefore i exist no he didn't say that i walk therefore i exist no right i uh, no i run therefore i exist no i think therefore i exist so existence first comes through comes to thinking substance right and that is the first thing from there you have to go you cannot bring in everything ag again you have to go only on that proposition so first take that proposition only what exist exist only the thinking being thinking being nothing exist only thinking being exist that you mark if only thinking being exist then how can you deduce others existence from the thinking being only that is the crux of descartes philosophy thinking beings means what only ideas now what are the ideas descartes says ideas means three types of ideas innate fictitious adventitious now the innate idea is god therefore god could exist okay innate idea is god so god is, idea of god is already there right god so this is the no that is one proof of existence of god he has given many proofs three proofs three different proofs but god is this is one proof that from from the very concept how can existence comes and this he brings from uh, augustine no augustine's idea of um, proof of god he brings that that from the very idea how existence comes now let me give one example so that you can understand it better suppose i say that here is some uh, here is a perfect perfect rose i say here is a perfect rose now what is the meaning of perfect rose 
whether that exists or not that we don't know right that we don't know because we have destroyed that simply you concentrate on the idea of perfect decker did it decker said if you analyze the idea of perfection means what perfection idea itself suggests that that idea is full of everything all the qualities all the possible qualities otherwise it will it is not perfect you just imagine i would say take a perfect rose but in that rose there is no smell can you say this is perfect rose no why because there is at least one because at least there is one quality that doesn't exist that is smell so that is not a perfect rose okay so perfect rose is a rose in which all the qualities are there okay and therefore when you say that idea of god exist in my mind as an idea and that idea is a perfect idea what does it mean it means all the possible qualities are present in that idea isn't it and if it is so and at the same time if you say that god doesn't exist it will be a contradiction because then it will not be perfect because perfect if it is perfect then it has all the qualities and you were saying it has one it has it doesn't have one quality that is it doesn't exist then it is not perfect it is 99% perfect but god's idea is perfect so it has to exist so god has to exist okay so this is how he he moves on from one idea to a Nivedita ma'am? Yeah, yeah, one thing Nivedita. I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, next, <laughs> next session is there. So, yeah, next uh, session. Actually, I, I was just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, so, uh, if you, so if you allow, then I can go on. But uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm taking the, no, <laughs> I'm taking more time. It's yeah. already 8 p.m. Yeah, so yeah, yeah think, thank you. I think, uh, I think we should stop now. So thank you very much, sir. And Nivedita, ma'am, please. Uh, so others, please can uh, can call me uh, if uh, if they have doubt, and I we can talk uh, at any time, no problem. And thank you, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> thank you, Devasis. Thank you, Nivedita. Thank you, all the organizers. We are very lucky and glad that uh, you have presented such a thing before us. Thank you very much, sir. And Nivedita. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Please, please solve the riddle, sir. Please solve the riddle of the rose. Please solve the riddle of the rose. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it is uh, really, uh, in in fact, that is the that is the germ of philosophy, and the riddle has should not be solved, right? The riddle should not be solved because that gives you momentum. But I simply said that look. And here we we can uh, differentiate between realist and idealist, right? The whole philosophical debates go on because the first one who believe that the red the rose is red, therefore it looks red. They are realist, and the people who believe that it looks red, therefore it is red. They are idealist. And as the debate between realist and idealist are no are never solved. And I am sure that this is not going to be solved. Similarly, this riddle is also not going to be solved. Simply, we can find uh, modifications and uh, welfare of that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I can say that. Then only. it cannot. <laughs> yeah. So we can. We, you can. You can bring. You can bring alternatives to that riddle and go on doing that. Going. No, through. I was confused because that I am. I was not getting any solution to the problem. I didn't getting, know that it will be a. It will be reduced to a problem. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Very good. But getting getting an answer is not the job of philosophy, madam. Uh, asking a of question not. is the job of but philosophy. But you have given us a task, now. So, so yeah. we have to do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, and we will do it yeah, uh, together. You. 
we will do it together let other speaker also speak thank you <laughs> thank, thank you. you thank you so nivedita ma'am please present formal vote of thanks then okay. will invite i think devasis i think um, uh, kolas sir first should speak and i think i am the i am the member of this group so i i don't need a formal vote of thanks so let kolas sir speaks and i am really extremely sorry that uh, i intruded some time uh, for him <laughs> no, no sir no sir actually thank you yeah, yeah. Uh, thank thank you very much sir so i, I welcome our next speaker uh, dr kolas chandra maharana sir so we are with, um, uh, our philosophy family actually feels very proud that uh, Kailash Chandra Maharana's effort uh, for this uh, for organizing and coordinating all these uh, program. So we have seen him as coordinating maximum program of philosophy family. So I heartily welcome you, sir, uh, to today's session as a speaker. So uh, uh, a brief introduction, a very brief introduction. of kailash maharana sir is that he did his master degree mphil and phd from utkal university and uh, he did his phd on a comparative and critical study of professor uh, ratnakara pati and ganeshwara mishra under the supervision of ganesh prasad professor ganesh prasad das sir and he has written five books in spite of that he is a a uh, reputed excellent teacher uh, in the state who has been awarded as uh, guru gaurav samman by the loko sevak mandala and uh, the best nss program officer of the state so sir is uh, uh, i have no, no i have no words to give uh, such a introduction to sir so uh, sir, uh, sir please uh, start your Uh, start your lecture here uh, in this world i welcome you sir please oh thanks so much devasis for your sweet words on me uh, i also uh, uh, congrat professor dr patitapan das for his uh, brilliant uh, uh, presentation today i have no words to express my gratitude to him Uh, i must thank you uh, the oa you have uh, hosted and recorded the events of the webinar series to be ended today uh, i have no words to offer my gratitude for your uh, strain patience and commitment for the philosophy family um, now friends uh, i extend a very hearty welcome to all of you uh, connected with this uh, virtual academy program though it is uh, though it is uh, too late uh, to uh, present my uh, address uh, here uh, uh, so anyway i have to uh, make the proceedings very shortcut a uh, before uh, presenting the proceedings of the webinar series it's my honor and responsibility to offer gratitude to all of you to make the webinar series successful and meaningful for the first time in the philosophical tradition of odisha the philosophy family has taken an adventurous academic program which would have benefited the students scholars teachers of philosophy during such pandemic times a uh, friends uh, last day i told you that the pandemic covid 19 has offered a lot of opportunity to be carried out Uh, how can i forget the noble thought and dream of sri pramod kumar das behind all the events he created a group then he combined us we extended our support to him but indeed whatever he dreamt we just carried out till date we have conducted two monthly uh, webinars for professor Uh, professor prapul kumar bahapatra and professor saraj kumar mahanti our our report uh, teachers uh, delivered their talk on the applied ethics and the indian th uh, theories of uh, morality and the ethics of art uh, respectively i on behalf of philosophy family bow down before their intellectual pursuit and wish them for the cause of uh, philosophy friends we have also conducted another monthly webinar in collaboration with 
wisdom intellectual forum puri where we invited professor dr gangadhar pande to speak on the topic uh, the secret of mahima dharma it was very very excellent and it was very understood uh, by the um, participants so far we have uh, completed five webinar series based on uh, the syllabus of undergraduate students they are indian philosophy greek philosophy history of uh, western philosophy and the cats uh, meditation and ishapanishad now we are continuing webinar series on bhagavad gita friends i would like to place the proceedings of the webinar series which completed uh, recently and that is the history of ancient uh, greek philosophy and the history of western philosophy from bacon to kant that is uh, today uh, um, it ended with the talk of uh, dr patita vonadas and uh, he was having a very magical presentation today that i have never listened you must have viewed the webinar series on uh, greek philosophy where professor uh, mohin mohammed professor of philosophy gangadhar meher university sambalpur was invited as our guest speaker professor mahabad beautifully reflected his talk uh, for four days taking eight hours on the th thinkers of pre socratic uh, pre socratic period uh, philosophy of uh, socrates philosophy of post uh, socratic period from ancient period to modern period friends this webinar series started on 2nd september and ended on 7th september the students and scholars got opportunity to know the philosophical acumen of professor mohin mohammed within a short span of time he tried to focus and reflect all the basic concepts within a short span of time from his deep understanding of the philosophy of ancient greek philosophers we offer our hearty gratitude for sharing his understanding and philosophical reflection with all of you again i offer my sincere gratitude on behalf of philosophy family to him the next series of webinar series one on the history of western philosophy which started on 8th september and ended today it started with the philosophy of francis bacon and ended with the philosophy of immanuel kant but formally it ended with the talk of patita bhavana das on the first day we invited professor dr akwaras chandra das to present the inaugural session of the history of western philosophy uh, professor das spoke on the philosophy of uh, francis bacon uh, particularly he concentrated his uh, lecture on the theory of ideology in the second session dr k omnaran rao spoke on the inductive method from philosophy of francis bacon which was moderated by the basi sarangi dr das and dr rao very intelligently uh, uh, clarified all the concepts of uh, uh, of the philosophy of bacon the first day ended with uh, the exchange of interactive session from the participants due to uh, the constraint of time it is not possible for me uh, to read out and to present all the subject matter uh, the summary of all the uh, uh, two webinars on the, uh, the uh, 9th september was the day of philosophy of rene decades professor pramod kumar das was assigned to speak on the universal doubt and existence of self and professor vasant kumar das was assigned to speak on decades concept a conception of god mind and body the reflective thought of uh, sri pramod kumar das and dr bk das inspired and influenced uh, the participant we thank uh, both the speakers for their creative thought and presentation on the philosophy of decades the third day was uh, the day of uh, uh, discussing decades meditation which happened to be a paper for uh, ug students for the benefit of uh, ug students during uh, the pandemic time the organizers thought it vital to be communicated to all the ug students and pg students dr nushan chandra samantaray was uh, uh, um, was a senior teacher in philosophy he contributed a book on decades meditation two years back and he was invited to share his thoughts on decades meditation 
Dr. Samantarai made a conceptual clarification on all the basic ideas of RNA Descartes. It was a thought provoking uh, presentation. We offer gratitude to Dr. N.G. Samantarai for his reflective thought. On 11th September, we organized a webinar on the philosophy of Spinoza. Dr. Atnagar Gajendra, a senior most teacher in philosophy of the state, spoke on substance, attribute, and modes. And Dr. K. Umdan Rao spoke on pantheism and parallelism and made all the, all the, all the concepts clear. On uh, 12th September, the, I, I'm going to make it very shortcut. Uh, on uh, 12th September, the webinar was focused on the philosophy of uh, Leibniz, which was delivered by Dr. Devadatta Misra and Sri Pramod Kumar Das. On, on 13th September, Dr. Jatin Bisoy was invited to present his lecture on epistemology from the philosophy of John Locke and Dr. Pragya uh, Prakashni Das Kanungo. Uh, was invited to speak on substance uh, from the philosophy of John Locke. Uh, really, the talk of Dr. Bisoy and Dr. Das Kanugo were very reflective for the students. On 14th September, we invited Dr. Narayan Behera to speak on a judge of Berkeley's reputation of abstract idea and matter. And Debasi Sarangi was invited to speak on the subject of idealism and solipsism on the philosophy of Judge Workless. It was also very interesting and uh, reflective. Uh, 15 September was dedicated to the philosophy of David Hume, uh, Hume uh, which was uh, presented by Professor <coughs> Indu Khanduri. Uh, he, uh, he clearly reflected the idea of cause and uh, uh, substance, epistemology, and uh, skepticism, which is mind blowing. We all enjoyed the the, program, the, uh, the lecture of Dr. Khanduri, and uh, actually we bow down uh, before him for her reflective thought and uh, inclusive popular philosophy. Whenever the pre scheduled speaker hesitated to attend the webinar, Say Pramod Kumar Das, all of a sudden agreed to carry it out, agreed to carry out the schedule program. Say Pramod Kumar Das agreed to speak on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant when the schedule speakers were absent. That is, uh, he spoke on rationalism, empiricism, synthetic a priori judgment on 16th uh, September. We uh, we offer a gratitude to him uh, for his. Uh, uh, for his immediate action uh, to uh, to continue the webinar series at every moment. Similarly, on uh, 17 September, Dr. Sachinder Raul agreed to present the webinars of two sessions on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. He beautifully reflected Kant's uh, a conception on uh, space, time, category, schematism, and antinomy. Uh, uh, Dr. Raul was a expert on the philosophy of Kant and he made justice to the philosophy of Kant and he tried to reach the unreached. And he, uh, he made a very conceptual clarification of all the basic ideas of Kant before the students, scholars, and teachers' philosophy. And today, what we listened and learned from Dr. Patitavan Das is mind blowing, really mind blowing. He presented such, uh, such a uh, nice uh, lecture. Um, and uh, he um, he presented the overview of Western European philosophy that I have never witnessed. His presentation is very innovative, interesting, and reflective. Within a short span of time, he could present such a nice lecture from Bacon to Kant that uh, uh, we have never listened. Really, I have never listened. We record his brilliant presentation for the noble cause of philosophy. Friends, due to positive time, it is not possible in my part to present the details of proceedings, to present the summary of the proceedings, and to the summary of all the webinars before you. On, I, on behalf of the philosophy family, offer my deep sense of gratitude to all the speakers, those who have spared their time and presentation for the cause of philosophy. I feel honored to offer the gratitude to our coordinators 
and moderators, Dr. Patita Bhavanadas, Dr. Om Naran Rao, Dr. Kalyani Sarangi, Dr. Pragyam Prakashan Das, Nibedita Priyadarsani, Mahishrata Mahanti, and uh, our dear Debasi Sarangi for their commitment uh, throughout the webinar series. Our admini and convener, Sri Pramod Kumar Das, had excellently planned, chucked out, and executed all the owners in spite of his family and the personal problems. That we all know. We thank to all the participants and coaching readers throughout the webinar series, without whom the webinar series would not have been meaningful and uh, successful. And I'm grateful to them for their reflective thought, for their understanding, and for their deep sense of listening, patient hearing all the programs. I would like to offer my gratitude to all the student participants for making the program, for making the webinar series successful through their silent observation, through their silent listening. Friends, we are going to conduct webinar series on ethics and applied ethics from 25th September to 30th September for the larger benefit of undergraduate students. So far as uh, the CBCS uh, syllabus is concerned. We hope the students and teachers will cooperate with us and extend their hands with us to make all the future programs very successful and meaningful. Last but not least, I thank all the participants, all the scholars and the students, teachers, those who have cooperated with us throughout the webinar series. And I especially uh, offer my gratitude, my love to Mr. Devasi Sarangi for his uh, for his strain, for his commitment and love for philosophy because he has recorded all the programs and shared the, uh, shared the lecture program to the um, YouTube. I thank you very much. I thank all the all the organizers for making the uh, webinar series very successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, Nivedita, ma'am. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so, propose the board of things. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, on behalf of the entire members of the philosophy family, and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to the speaker of today's session, Dr. Prakrita Bhavan Das, sir, for your remarkable presentation, as well as for sharing your findings and understanding on Western European philosophy. Thank you so much, sir. I must thank Kaya, sir, for your detailed discussion on the proceedings. I must thank you for your endless cooperation and to the uh, and coordination to philosophy family. Uh, I must be thank thankful you. to thank you, Hello, hello. I thank Nibedita, madam. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I also thank Nibedita, madam. Yeah, thank you, Nibedita. We all thank, thank you, Nibedita, madam. Okay. Thank Nibedita you. Thank you. Thanks to Nibedita. Sir, and they are rising now. They are rising. Okay. Uh, they are rising. They are rising. Really, they are rising. Okay, okay, okay. Actually, rising. actually, actually, the philosophy family feels proud of them. Yes, they are the rising stars of philosophy. The young rising oh. stars. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> should Thank come you, forward with the papers. Nipadita should should deliver talks next time. Thank you, sir. Uh, I must be thankful to all the speakers who have been played a vital role in understanding the philosophy by showing their, uh, by sharing their thoughts to us. Thank you all. I must give my vote of thanks to Mr. Devasi Sarangi sir for your extended coordination for this webinar. Your, uh, your effort for the uh, development of philosophy family is praiseworthy. Thank you, sir. Uh, I must give my gratitude and vote of thanks to the founders and organizing committee of uh, philosophy family, uh, Dr. Pramod Kumar Das, sir, uh, Dr. K. Om Narend, sir, including Dr. Kaula, sir, and Pathita Bhavan, sir, and also to Devasi Sarangi, sir. Uh, 
and all the teachers who are in some way involved in the intellectual development. I must give my vote of thanks to the participants and students for joining the webinar and for uh, their participation in this interaction session as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, program now ends here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all. Have a wonderful evening. So the program ends now. Thank you.